Gorbachev is a controversial figure at times. The symbolic death of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War are both ascribed to his name, as he was the final leader of the Soviet Union before the state collapsed. This is, however, a somewhat unearned reputation for Gorbachev, since he was very much on the side of the Soviet Union and communism. But he did understand that the way the Soviet Union operated when he came to power was unsustainable. So he implemented three key policies for the Soviet Union during his time in power. The first is that he declared the nations of the Warsaw Pact free to choose their own future, where in the past the Soviets had invaded Hungary and Czechoslovakia to force their compliance, the Soviets would no longer directly intervene in the politics of the Eastern European states. This can be seen as the symbolic end of the Cold War, as with this declaration, the Eastern Bloc fell out of the Soviet sphere, as before the Soviet Union had even collapsed, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary had already left the Warsaw Pact, causing the Warsaw Pact in itself to become obsolete and abolished. Then internally he started two new reforms, Glasnost and Perestroika. Glasnost meant openness, and it essentially allowed the population of the Soviet Union to levy criticism on the system and the party. This was meant to ease unrest as the population now had a venue to vent their dissatisfaction as well as to give the party a way to actually hear the criticism from the population and reform their system accordingly. And the second reform was perestroika which literally means rebuilding or restructuring and this was far more far reaching. The Soviet command economy has been stagnant for decades and while Gorbachev was an avid socialist he did seek to introduce some aspects of a slightly more liberal economy in an attempt to revitalize the stagnant economy. Essentially, he wanted to balance a socialist economy with some free market aspects. But sadly for Gorbachev, these reforms weren't enough, and even led to the death of the Soviet Union at the time that it did. Glasnost allowed the population to complain, and complain they did, extensively. Meanwhile, the perestroika initially only made the economic issues far worse, and as shortages increased, unrest only grew and grew in the nation. So, by 1991, it was essentially over for the Soviet Union. The Warsaw Pact had fallen, the Soviet international power was broken, and the constituent republics sought independence as the people wanted change. Gorbachev would be the final leader of the Soviet Union as it collapsed in 1991. His reforms had failed, and his beloved Union was now gone. But despite his flaws, I still have respect for this man. The Soviet Union wasn't set or destined to fall in 1991. Who knows how much longer the Soviet Union could have lasted if it had continued to be a horrifying dictatorship, forcefully putting down any internal and Warsaw Pact unrest. If the Soviet leaders had simply continued to put their head in the ground instead of choosing reform, their failed system could have potentially lasted years or decades longer. Therefore, I very much respect Gorbachev for actually taking the risk and recognizing that change was needed, now more than ever. Despite his reforms failing and even contributing to the fall of the Soviet Union, they came from a good place. And now, this Tuesday, the 30th of August 2022, he passed away at the age of 91. In his honor, today we will be discussing a scenario where Gorbachev's reforms had the intended effect of revitalizing the Soviet system without ripping the Soviet Union apart. So we start this alternate scenario in 1985, the year that Gorbachev came into power. This is fundamentally still the same Gorbachev, seeing the same issues with the Soviet Union as he did in our own timeline. In terms of foreign policy, Gorbachev would essentially try to end the Cold War, ending Soviet involvement in the Afghan war, seeking better relations with China, trying to abolish nuclear weapons, and more. But the more important part we need to discuss is Gorbachev's internal policies. Now a clear comparison we need to discuss right off the bat is China and the Soviet Union. Why did Deng Xiaoping manage to reform the Chinese system without collapsing while the Soviet Union didn't? In my opinion, it has two main reasons, an economic and a political one. As for the economic reason, China was way more radical in their economic reforms and they had a much weaker economy when they began their reforms, meaning that there was little to lose. It's easy to forget that despite all the flaws in the Soviet system, it did still have the second highest GDP, 
behind only America. It's very difficult to reform an economy that big. But even more importantly, Gorbachev was still fully convinced by communism and he wanted to reform the system on a much smaller scale. But he wanted to leave the core of the Soviet system intact. Bureaucrats would still set production targets, the government would still control most industries, etc. etc. But the more important difference is on the political side. Gorbachev was quite ambitious in his reforms. He didn't just seek to reform the Soviet economy, he took on the Soviet political system at the same time. While there was a worsening economic crisis and domestic unrest in the nation, Gorbachev gave the people, the media and local politicians more and more freedom to act without consent from the party. This freedom gave the media the option to criticize the party and call for independence. The people had the freedom to read and discuss differing opinions and decide that the communist party wasn't acting in their best interest. While the politicians on a republic level could listen to these voices and declare independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. In contrast, while China was becoming more and more open in their economy, their political system remained very rigid, where the party was the sole authority to be obeyed. Until finally, nothing happened on the 4th of June 1989 on Tiananmen Square. So, we need to make a decision here. We can either change Gorbachev fundamentally and make him go for a full market economy in the nation, while remaining a dictatorship like China did in their own timeline. But this goes directly against what Gorbachev was trying to accomplish. Instead, we are going to make Gorbachev more slow, steady and tactical in his reforms. His goals remain the same, but initially he prioritizes economic reform while only slowly opening up the political sphere as well. The first couple of years of Gorbachev's time in power would be the same. He would secure his allies in key positions of power to ensure that his reforms could be passed. As mentioned before, he would then start pulling the Soviet forces out of Afghanistan while trying to build down the Cold War and reduce military and especially nuclear spending while also starting on his economic reforms. But these economic reforms were fundamentally flawed since Gorbachev refused to fundamentally reform the Soviet economy. But they could still help somewhat alleviate the stagnation in the short term. What Gorbachev hoped is that a state-controlled company could still fill the role of a free market without actually needing a full market economy. He lowered the importance of the bureaucrats' production targets, allowing the state-owned companies more and more freedom in increasing or decreasing production as they pleased. This is where we reach a fork in this alternate timeline. If Gorbachev's keep going with this economic policy, then it's likely that the economy doesn't fundamentally reform. Now, I'm not an economist, so take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt, but what we will do in this alternate timeline is allow Gorbachev to reform the economy in a similar way, just slightly more radical. The bureaucratic production targets are scrapped, government subsidies are reduced, and the state-owned companies now have full control over their production and distribution, as long as they fill any direct orders given by the state. Fact is, that whatever reform we make here, they will still be flawed, but we don't need the Soviet economy to grow explosively, we just need enough economic growth to allow the Union to persist. Then politically, as mentioned before, Gorbachev was extremely ambitious. He wanted more differing opinions, discussion, an open media and more. These were all great ideas on their own, but are also extremely dangerous to introduce in the current state of the Soviet Union. As Gorbachev sees that his economic reforms don't immediately lead to a richer Union, he decides that these political ideas need to be postponed to ensure the Union's stability. We don't take away these ideals from this alternate Gorbachev, but instead he introduces them only on the party level first. Within the Soviet Politburo and the political sphere, there is more openness, but the media and the population, at least for now, remain restricted in a similar way as before. In 1986, the Chernobyl incident would still occur, the nuclear disaster. In the wake of this disaster, Gorbachev was pretty much left in the dark as party officials tried to downplay the disaster. In our own timeline, this opened Gorbachev's eyes even more to the flaws of the Soviet system, leading to him stating in a public address that the Soviet Union was flawed and corrupt and had to reform. Our alternate Gorbachev has the same realization, but he doesn't publicly state this to the entire Soviet population, instead focusing on reforming the top of the system. 
The years from 1987 to 1991 would be the darkest hours for this alternate Soviet Union. By no means did we fundamentally fix the Union yet. This alternate Soviet Union still has similar economic issues, especially as many state-owned industries are going bankrupt without direct government subsidies. Meanwhile, the state is still just as repressive towards its population as it has always been. During these years, unrest also rocks the Soviet sphere, where Gorbachev would make the difficult decision to allow the Warsaw Pact, and thereby Soviet power projection into Europe, to fall. This would be extremely unpopular, but it would be the correct decision to make. As Gorbachev himself stated, the Eastern European states, Cuba, Indochina and North Korea were just drains on the Soviet economy while giving them very, very little in return. How these five years turn out would make or break the Soviet Union. Inefficient state companies would finally be allowed to fall, while the successful ones would finally have some incentive to modernize. As the Cold War was coming to an end, Gorbachev would attempt to improve relations with the Europeans and the Asian nations in particular, as well as with the Americans. In this alternate 1991, the Cold War would still pretty much be over. It would just be less explosive than in our own timeline. While the Soviet Union managed to hold on through oppression of their population, much like China, the Eastern European states had now definitively broken with the Soviet Union. So now we have to get to the actual fixing of the Union, at least in a limited capacity. While the Union has not collapsed, it's still in an economic freefall. State industries are collapsing left and right, shelves are now empty, and the Union is hanging on by a thread. But with the Cold War now over, the Soviets do still have their most powerful tool for the future, their natural resources. Europe was an energy-hungry continent willing to import a lot of oil and especially liquid gas from the Soviet Union. But the Soviets, during the 70s and the 80s, simply weren't able to provide these, as inefficient companies operated the distribution and pumping of these resources. This would have to be one of Gorbachev's main priorities during his time in power. While making the economy rely on oil and gas exports will definitely bring many issues later on down the road, but at least it provides an easy money revenue for the short term, giving him time to further fix the Soviet system. With a mix of government intervention and allowing the inefficient companies to fall, by 1995 the Soviets could finally have a much more healthy oil and gas production. Russia itself holds about 25% of the world's natural gas, and when including the rest of the Soviet Union, this number rises to 30%. Now, does this income source fix everything? Absolutely not, but it does provide a nice baseline for the Soviet economy to expand on. Despite the Soviet system being extremely flawed, they still have much production capacity which could potentially be utilized to build up their industrial sector. So after the economic turmoil from 1985 to 1995, the late 90s would finally be a time of economic revitalization. There would be many ups and downs, but as military and nuclear spending is reduced, the Soviets no longer need to subsidize our satellite states, and revenue from energy is finally increasing, the Soviets would have some kind of budget to work with without putting themselves deeper and deeper in debt. How successful this would be is obviously impossible to say, but I'd say that there is a decent chance that with the limited economic reforms and the now good relations with the West, the Soviets could manage economic growth again. This wouldn't be explosive like the Chinese growth, and the Soviet economy would settle into being mostly a rentier state, where the export of their natural resources is the key factor, but the domestic Soviet industry would finally start working again to fulfill the domestic demand as requested by the Communist Party, while exporting any excess products to Europe and to a lesser degree America, giving an increased profit motive to the state-owned companies. This alternate Soviet Union going into the 2000s will be a mix between a way less successful China and a way more successful Russia from our own timeline. And this climate of economic growth would finally be the environment where Gorbachev can actually start reforming the Soviet political sphere in more radical ways. With the economy on the rise again, increasing the level of political freedoms can be done in such a way that it doesn't immediately cause the collapse of the Union, as in the end, people are willing to accept many things as long as everything keeps getting better for them. The economic improvements combined with the increased political freedoms 
would finally give the Soviet population a feeling of optimism about the future. These political reforms would, over time, include giving more autonomy to the different republics of the Union, freeing the press, allowing public dissent and debates, and maybe even a limited form of democracy, Western media being allowed, freedom of religion in the previously atheist nation, and more. These wouldn't necessarily all happen at once, but during the late 90s and the 2020s, these are the reforms that would be enacted by Gorbachev. Then in terms of foreign policy, during the 2000s, the final confrontation would also have to take place between the Soviets and the West. Would the Soviet Union really decisively say goodbye to their former sphere of influence in Eastern Europe? Would the Soviets allow Eastern Europe to be fully integrated into the European Union or NATO? In my opinion, it is very likely that Gorbachev would indeed allow this. After all, Soviet relations with Europe are only becoming warmer and warmer, and the only way for the Soviets to forcefully reassert themselves in the region would be via invasions, which is something very few Soviet leaders, and especially not Gorbachev, would desire. Perhaps a deal is reached where the European Union and even NATO are allowed to expand, but limits are put on the amount of foreign forces that are allowed on the Soviet borders and nuclear weapons aren't allowed in Eastern Europe. The economic crash of 2008 would give the Soviet system another massive boost of legitimacy, as their economy was impacted way less than their European and American counterparts, especially as the price of oil and gas in Europe only rose during this period netting the Soviets even more income on that front. So, as we come to wrapping this scenario up, let's delve into the differences between this scenario and our own timeline. On the world stage, relatively little would have changed at the end of the day, as I chose to make Gorbachev focus on internal affairs. The Soviets would remain the second most powerful nation on Earth for a little while, until becoming third after the rise of China. Economically speaking, the Soviet would be the fourth largest economy in the world in terms of GDP adjusted for PPP, only behind China, Japan and America. When compared to our own timeline, the Soviet Union is way better off, excluding the Baltic states. With the many states united, the poorer nations in our timeline are spared from most of this economic pain as the larger Union can provide assistance. Meanwhile, wars, conflicts and competition between the ex-Soviet states are replaced with mostly cooperation. With Gorbachev's economic policies, the standard of living in the Union would gradually start to rise as the economy would start to grow, instead of the wealthy Russian oligarchs consolidating the economy and reinvesting most of the profits in the Western world. The Union as a whole would eventually be significantly richer than the ex-Soviet states are in our own timeline. But the biggest difference would be politically. While it's impossible to say by how far the political reforms would go, this alternate Soviet Union would be competing with mostly strict dictatorships and pseudo-democracies in the post-Soviet states of our own timeline. It is safe to say that adding to the Soviet citizens being richer than your average post-Soviet citizen of our own timeline, they would more than likely also be a lot more free. And that is where I'll end this scenario. Let us know in the comments where you think this scenario goes from here. Does the Soviet economy face a second crash somewhere down the line thanks to being too reliant on oil and still not being much of a free market economy? Does the successor to Gorbachev seek to reinstall the Soviets as a global powerhouse, restarting a new cold war between China, the Soviets and the West? Or does the Soviet Union continue down their current path, slowly but steadily becoming a freer and richer place to live? Honestly, at this point the scenario has gone on for way too long for me to make any form of judgement on this. But anyways, thank you all for watching. As always, to support the channel, consider leaving a like and a comment. Even just commenting hi helps the channel out massively. Subscribe for more, as there will be a new alternate history scenario every single Friday, as well as more history related content on most Sundays and Mondays. And we are currently having a viewer scenario contest running each Wednesday. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.